Hello and welcome to Tea with the Druid. Uh, I'm Kerry Lee and I'll be chatting to you about the idea of authenticity, validity and the influence of the ancients on uh, our modern druid path. Oh hello Connie, <laughs> nice to see you. Oh look, it's proper hot, hot tea <coughs> with a druid delivered by the very lovely Dave the Bard. Thank you. <laughs> A kind of, oh hello Judy <laughs> and Danny oh, oh hello everybody oh from the Czech Republic oh my goodness from everywhere hello everyone hello Ellie <laughs> lots and lots of people all out crikey everyone from everywhere um it's really good to see everybody and I'm sure I'll see more of you guys all joining in as we go on um I I just, for those of you who don't know who the heck I am, uh, my name is Kerry Lee. Uh, I am a druid in the o Obod Order. I've been with it for 20 years or more. Um, and I do all kinds of things, workshops, talks, artwork, all kinds of things, all inspired and, and uh, fabulously kind of groovy with druidry. Uh, I'm a bit nervous because I've never done this before so stick with me and maybe we'll have a good old chat and see uh, how we all feel about this subject. Um, so I had a script and in my script I thought it might be quite interesting to see whether anybody else felt that they were driven, whether they felt like they needed to confess a huge and terrible addiction to diving deep into mythology, story, poetry, all of the beautiful deep well of inspiration that our ancients across the eons have left us. I am thoroughly addicted and I feel the pull of the ancients it's like a song that sings in my heart mind and soul and and what it does is it gets me diving deep into my emotions and into my psychology and it gets me diving into myths and poems and all kinds of wonderful things from from the past and what i do with that stuff with that siren song that that drags me down into that fabulous otherworldly ocean is send me into a frenzy of passionate engagement with ritual and with writing and with artwork trying to bring all of those treasures back to the surface and reinvent them and reanimate them for modern life gosh there's so many people joining portugal tennis davis john davis james has heather bower from los angeles rob butler from bristol crikey there's so many of you out there <laughs> hello um yes so a self-confessed, desperate ritualist drawing on the inspiration of that deep, deep well of, of myth, story and legend. Um, I have spent many, many years working with all of these things, trying, trying to still those voices um, that, that inspire ma magic and myth. And for me, they they re-enchant the world. Their, their job is to re-enchant the world. So as I'm being haunted and as I'm struggling to think about anything other <laughs> than, than myths and legends, <laughs> Kirsty, there's waving hands everywhere. Um, sometimes I go over to my allotment and I just, I do vegetable things because it's the only thing you can do. To, to stop the noises, um, but they're still waiting when I come home. And, and so I dive back in again, literally obsessed. And I am just curious how many people out there feel the same way. 
Hello from Geneva. <laughs> Karen, it's good to see you too on here. Yes, this addiction. I'm kind of dis I'm going to ignore all of the beautiful names that are coming up on the side now because oh thank you for <laughs> brilliant artwork. Thank you. Um because otherwise I, I will just ramble on forever and ever and it will last far longer than uh, 20 minutes that it's supposed to and uh, and I'll get in trouble. <laughs> Here's the thing. My thoughts are that as humans, we are a narrative species. We we think in narrative. We we talk in narratives. We perceive the world through narratives. We see throughout history that we have worked our spiritual paths around narrative whenever there was an event whenever there was something huge whenever there was something that affected us emotionally physically or anything we have created a story around it we have we have brought gods and mythologies that inspire and help us make sense of this chaotic universe we live in and i love that i am absorbed by it i am captured by it i am a prisoner of it um my glasses keep it's a bit hot in here so my glasses keep sliding down and it's interesting uh, for me when science was still magic and narratives were filled with fantastical beings and events and there was always a way to placate them there was always a way to defeat or to um, bring gods on side there was always bargains to be had and we did that through ritual we did that through prayer we did that through journey into the other world and we were talking to our fellow earthlings our plants our trees the mountains the lakes the rivers all of these things were our allies in the world all of these things were powerful to our living every day and we created rituals and incantations and we made sacrifices and prayers to smooth the paths between the elemental world and our own and we ventured beyond the confines of what we considered to be the apparent world with our allies maybe as wolves or ravens or bears coming with us traveling with us on these journeys but when the gulf between science and magic uh, started to to become unbridgeable and become you know the mysteries of the world started to become less mysterious they become some of the ways we'd interpreted them started to be thought of as possibly superstitions or whatever we began a different journey we began we, we began working with a different narrative and that narrative was quite fun for a while. It was an interesting ride and we jumped on it and we all hailed the mechanistic way of thinking <laughs> over, over the time. They thought, uh, you know, making the world feel more friendly, less difficult, less chaotic, more understandable, more tangible, more controllable even maybe. And yet we lost magic in the world, it seems. It, it loved the magic ebbed and and we lost something of ourselves in in that in that journey which is is interesting how cycles and things come around because these days with the theory the advent of things like quantum theory and and those kinds of for me quite magical scientific uh, thoughts and processes it seems that magic and science were just the same thing but with different jargons and different different definitions so magic and science seem to me to be coming back together to to being more in harmony with each other because despite everything 
you know, science still has no answer for the fundamental questions of where life actually begins, you know, and it's, it's inspiring to see how much of the ancient stories actually reflect modern science and scientific thinking. I like that. Um, and it's interesting that when our world is in a bit of turmoil, one of the things that happens is we start really looking for a spiritual awakening. We start looking for a way to find hope in the world, to find magic again, to find mystery again, to, to revive our flagging spirits and to, to find something to hang on to in the world. I kind of write, I really liked an analogy I wrote down earlier, so I'm going to actually say it anyway, this kind of mechanistic and materialistic thinking that, that um, to me seemed like a roller coaster ride, that when we stepped on it, it was like, it was all fun in the beginning, it was all interesting, and then all of a sudden it was like something whipped away my, my hat and something whipped away my scarf, and, and slowly I lost my sense of comfortable thought and spiritual certainty and I think that's when we start to feel adrift in the world and for me that's where my druidry comes in it's where I find I regain that magic and where I regain that 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 sense of of comfort and strength in the world druidry is my axis mundi it's my center point, it's my pillar that I anchor everything else in my life to. It's, it's very open. It's, it doesn't care what your backstory is. Druidry as a whole is, it doesn't, it doesn't know who we are. It's not a thing, it's a being, it's a thing of, it's a thing we do, it's a thing we are, like peace. Peace is a thing we are in the world and it's a thing we want to radiate and it's a thing that folklore can help connect us with roots that seem to have withered and died, but they haven't. When, when you imagine yourself as the Axis Mundi and you imagine your feet on the floor, as the roots that tapping into the earth, tapping into where the ancestors lie, tapping into the bones and blood of animals, plants, the, the mountains roots even, you know, where, where waters flow through the earth, our emotions flow with them. And when we dive into these ancient stories, we see reflections of ourself in this deep pool. So, for me, Druidry is about a way of re-enchanting the land. And I've heard, you know, keep an eye on the time here, I've heard a number of people over the years saying that there's no such thing as modern Druidry. Druidry just don't exist. It's, it's a fallacy. We don't know what uh, the ancients did. So how can we call ourselves Druids in a modern time? And I have to say that for me, uh, I'm prone to getting soap, soap boxes out. If anybody doesn't know what a soap box is, I will present it to you. I will untuck my metaphorical soap box and stand on it now. And I will shout passionately to those, piece, those people, you haven't experienced Druidry if you believe there are no Druids in modern days what we're doing is we are stopping and we are closing our eyes and we are breathing in the world in this moment and we are reaching out with all of our senses with all of our open heart and we are taking in the moment and we are linking it through thought and emotion and love through what we understand 
of the ancient Druids in the past. It doesn't matter what they did then. What matters is what we do now. And when we're in that place, in, in our Axis Mundi, when we're in our, in our power, in our moment, in this moment now, when we feel the land around us and we open our eyes not just once but as terry pratchett said when through granny weatherwax you stand and you stop and you open your eyes and then you open them again the druid is opening its eyes not just once but it's opening its second and its third and its fourth eye and its ears and its heart and it's listening to the song of the land it's listening to the tale of the birds. It's listening to the tale of every blade of grass that we stand upon. And we are sharing that. We are sharing those stories. We are part of their story and they are part of our story. And so it becomes easy to recreate magic in the world. It becomes easier to create ritual to engage with that, with that moment, with that feeling that the ancients must have had so much clearer in their hand-to-mouth existence, in that immediacy of life on the edge. And we can bring that magic. We can, we can tap into that magic. We can feel it. We can feel it now as they did then, through our own colour, through our own understanding, but also inspired by their words, by their poetry, by their song, by the song of the crow sitting outside, by the magpies that sing on my fence at five in the morning. And I say to the people who say, I can't be a druid in a modern time, even though I don't know what they did back then, I bet if you got 50 ancient druids and stuck them in a room and said, right tell me what ancient druidry was you'd get 63 different answers happily that's still the same you get 50 modern druids in a room and ask them what the answers to uh, and and to define modern druidry and you'd get 65 66 67 million different answers and i think that's fantastic because keridwen's brew never brewed the same awen for every single person three drops come out and after that it's poison they knew that every person's awen was different similar but maybe but different and i would say to them if you try to deny my validity and my authenticity in my modern druid path then you're denying the truth of Keridwen's story and all of the stories that have come since. For me, it's an endless cycle. There's an endless cycle of life, death and rebirth and everything that comes before. It are, is when it dies, fertilizes the ground for new seeds. And the old Druid's spirituality could not have been a static thing it must have changed and moved with the landscape and the ideas we know it did stonehenge's stones were moved around so many times over the time it was built so you know to to say there is no validity in modern druidry for me really my people come to the cauldron look into the rim over the rim into that dark well with us and see what there is there to see. I think I have probably chatted on enough. Does anyone fancy coming in on a meditation to actually look over the rim of the cauldron? If you do, find yourself, a, if you're not already sitting in a comfortable place, close your eyes with me and draw in a deep long breath 
Feel that breath resonating in your heart and your soul. Feel your body straight and true, present and comfortable. As you sit comfortable in your space, feel, feel your breath easy, feel your shoulders calm, feel your mind freeing of all outside disturbance. In and out as you breathe more relaxed and more comfortable. Around you, a mist is building. With every breath you breathe, the mist grows. It pulls around you, swirling and moving. And as you breathe, you feel this mist lifting you out of this time, out of this place. With every breath you rise and move, the mists surrounding, supporting, lifting you beyond the apparent world. Slowly below you, the mists begin to part, though you are safe and held, and you see below a great wide ocean, and below you on the ocean there is a ship sailing strong and true across the waves. You know this is Pridwin, Arthur's ship. You know that this ship is sailing towards Caia City. Allow the mists to let you drift gently down towards Pridwin. Feel yourself moving down gently, every breath careful and slow and considered as you journey down and down. Pridwin comes into view, riding on the waves, and you land gently on her deck. The waves rise and fall, the deck moves in harmony and you find you are able to stand comfortably, easily on this powerful, powerful ship as she thunders through the crashing waves. To the right of you, a tall warrior, bearded and cloaked, a strong sword at his side. He turns and smiles and nods a welcome. To the left of you, there is another figure. He is cloaked in a cloak of feathers. And as he turns, his brow is radiant and you see Taliesin. He nods and smiles, and you all look to the horizon where you see a large island with a tower gleaming upon it. Pridwin is riding through the waves, swift and sure, and there is a rising sense of excitement as you plough on toward the island. With every breath, the waves are crested 
with every breath, the sails billow above you, and you draw closer to Kaya City. Feel it drawing closer, Kaya City, the other world, across this great deep ocean, an ocean of dreaming, an ocean of magic, an ocean of mystery. Slowly Pridwin reduces speed and glides safely into the island's harbour. Arthur slaps you on the back and indicates that you should jump onto the harbour wall. With him and Taliesin as your guides, you all three jump away from Pridwin and find a path that leads you up to Kaya City. Notice everything about the castle. Notice everything about the tower. See the landscape. Everything you see here tells you something and gives you a message. Quickly you walk towards great doors that stand open to the tower and the castle. Notice how the doors look, what the castle is made of, how it feels, how it makes you feel. You stand on the threshold of the doors and through the gateway you see a great, great hall. And at the centre of this hall there is a great dark cauldron, dark rimmed with pearls around it. And you know this is the cauldron of the other world. Arthur has sought it. Three times the fill of Pridwin sought it, and none but seven ever returned. Arthur and Taliesin invite you through the gateway, and all three of you walk towards the great cauldron that sits above a burning fire. Vapour rises, twisting and turning, making shapes and patterns. There is a call and a whisper that seems to come from all around the hall. The cauldron is not destined to boil the meat of a coward or one forsworn. Do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to look into the cauldron of Anu? If you do, step up, step up to the great cauldron and look in over the rim. If you have the courage, let the vapours hold you, caress you and draw you down, down to look at the dark mirror, at the dark liquid kindled by the nine. What is it you see there? What is it that lies in the heart of you, mirrored in this otherworldly cauldron? Take a moment. Let your heart and mind be open. to see what you might see. A 
And now the vapors release you. Arthur touches your shoulder. Taliesin smiles and says, we must return. You will be one of the seven. You return to Pridwin. Slowly you walk down the pathway back to where she is moored. Onto the deck you all three leap. As Pridwin glides away from Kaya Sithi to ride again across the waves. The mists surround. They come with your breath. And as you thank Pridwin, Arthur and Taliesin and Kaya Sithi and the cauldron within, the mists take you up and up with every breath back out of the other world, back toward your own time, your own place, your own space. And as the mists part, you feel yourself back, back, back in this moment, in this time, in this body and in this place. Our journey to the other world is complete. My time is more than up. I thank you for joining me on this journey of exploration and chin wagging. And I will look through your comments and your things and I will try to reply to some of them. And I thank you very much for joining me on Tea with the Druid today. Take care. Much love. Bye bye.